Welcome to uh, breakout session micronutrient management for top canola yields. I'd like to thank the Washington Canola Rapeseed Commission for sponsoring this session. Uh, the speaker today is uh, Phil Thomas. You guys already heard him earlier. Uh, he's the president of Grass Smith Corporation Limited in Alberta, Canada. And uh, he's going to talk with you guys without a PowerPoint presentation. So please feel free to ask questions at any time. Yes. Okay, it's all yours. Thank you. Would you mind using the podium? Oh yes, because that way that they one. can get them, they can mic you. Thank you. Everyone hear me at the back? Okay. Uh, this might be a very short session. Uh, when we're talking micronutrient deficiencies, uh, they're usually fairly specific. I brought up one in my presentation about Molly, and it's darn difficult to get an accurate soil sample for it. But if you ever see the symptoms, you know darn well you've got to look at a, that particular nutrient. Uh, for you guys that grow brassica crops like broccoli, cauliflower, uh, what it'll do is it, it, it actually causes a blind point. Your main apical meristem quits operation. And so you've got a plant sitting there with no elongation that's going to happen. Occasionally it'll send out some secondary shoots on it, and they don't even do very well in a molly deficiency system. But it's, it's, to my understanding, it's limited to part of the Palouse where we've got a volcanic soil. And I'd like to l learn a lot more about that. Uh, it's one I've definitely talked over with growers up here. And they haven't noticed this. It looks like an SU uh, problem when, it, when you first see it. So if you do see that where you just aren't getting in certain areas of the field where you aren't getting it, then it's something to look at. Uh, on the boron side of things, it's such a critical component. And we've had soils experts out there telling farmers, well, in Western Canada, you'll never need to use boron. We've got more than enough boron. But the problem is, they're, unfortunately, they're going on old research work where we're pulling out 25 bushels per acre and we're now growing 50 and 60. Uh, there's a huge difference between those two and how important boron is in the crop. There was a study done just a, a year ago, a three-year study in Ontario, and 75 per, uh, I'm sorry, 78 percent of the trials that were done showed a positive response to boron application. And they were using a soil uh, boron solubor at a relatively low level of just a, you know, not even two pounds, because it, it doesn't take much. So how did you know, uh, or how do you know if you're boron deficient? Uh, soil test, there is an attention level of uh, one part per million. Unfortunately, I think that's too low. I think we should be a uh, little higher on there to look at it, probably getting up into the three range, three parts per million, and then do a test strip, see if you get a response. Can you tell by tissue? Uh, you can, and in fact, we had more tissue tests out there last summer, and a surprising number of them were darn near down to our attention level in Western Canada. In Ontario, it was much higher. Like we've got agricultures with Agritrend right across all of Canada and now across the US in a lot of locations, and so we put a huge emphasis on tissue testing as well as proper soil testing. Uh, the problem in Western Canada is probably only 15% of the farmers utilize a soil test, and so their nutrient application load is by formula, and that doesn't work. Not if you're targeting a high yield. We know how much N has to go into a a 60 bushel crop, and we know how much of the other nutrients as well are, have to be in that plant. Like we've got some of the best soil scientists in the world working with us. Yes? On boron, do you prefer it to be put into the ground as far as a deep man application, or can it be applied over the top? Uh, you can apply both. 
boron is very mobile in the soil. Uh, when we were doing our, our trials, we were putting it in the uh, nitrogen band. And once it's into the moisture, it moves fairly frequently. But you've got to look at your, what's your soil organic matter. If you've got a soil organic matter of, uh, say, getting up to 6 7%, and you've got a low rainfall zone, you're probably never going to need much boron. Because all of your, all of your boron that's going into that plant from your, from your seed bed is going to be out of that organic matter breakdown. But I like to see, personally, I like to see it go in the ground because it's a lot less hit and miss. It's going to be absorbed into the plant, go up through the phloem to the flowers, and it's going to solve the problem. When you go to a foliar application, uh, when do you put it on? Most of our guys, a lot of them are putting it on with their fungicide for sclerotinia control, which is 20 to 30% flowering, which in my books is too late. You've got to get it on the bud so the bud can actually absorb it. It's absorbed fairly good through the bud walls. And get it into the stigma by the time that flower opens. It's got adequate boron for the pollen tubes that got to grow and to make G GABA. <laughs> but yeah, I like to see it go on the ground. It's very mobile in the soil, so if you're in a very high rainfall zone or you're very high levels of irrigation water going on, you might move it out of the root zone. So where do I find information on how much boron I need if, so like I'm in a 10 inch rainfall area, so my, the limiting factor on the yield is moisture. Yeah. So to balance that, where do I find these charts, like if you only get 10 inches of moisture a year, how much boron do you need? That, that's a good and question. Yeah. Is there any publication out there that I can... It's all up here in our... Uh, our soils gurus <laughs> but one of the things that you can tell is just simply what I was talking about pull off pods finish flowering go out and pull a lot of pods out and hold them up to the sun and see how many blanks you have because most of those blanks are going to be caused either by high temperature or boron deficiency and That's it. But it gives you a darn good idea what you should be looking at next year. <laughs> so does the tissue test. Can you take a tissue test and then do an equation? You know, that's, that's what we're doing. A week and a half before uh, blooming, and would that give you any kind of a Yes, it does. Can you get the tissue test back quick enough? Yeah, yeah we, we can. We can get it back in, uh, I'm not sure, three, four days. Well, as I say, the attention level is one part per million. That's what we've been using, and we had a great discussion here two weeks ago in Cancun uh, about that. Should we, in fact, be higher? And we, most of us, felt that we should be in that three parts per million, and then really recommend our clients go out and do a, a strip trial just to see whether it's going to pay off. Like of this Ontario work, out of the 78% that showed a positive response, is that really valid? When you go and look at actually what response you got, yes, it was positive, it gave you a yield increase, but was it economically valid? And in that case, it was 43% of the time that they applied, it, and we had the soil tests on those, and they were in that two, three parts per million, and yet we were still getting a yield response. So what about tissue results? Uh, it's going to tell, tell you how much is in the plant at that time, and your attention level is the same. Because you want it at that upper tissue level. Grab a clump of buds that you're going to send in, upper part of the plant. So do you have work on how much boron I would need for like a, a yield? It's a micronutrient, so you're going to put on very little. Like uh, where we were getting the response, I can't remember what Ontario was using. I think it was less than two pounds of the acre of solubor. So it's a very low one. Uh, the big problem with, uh, with boron is it's very toxic. Like we had trials where we put in three pounds with the seed, three pounds of boron with the seed, and there was not a plant come up. And that's why I say it should go in the band, 
reduce the level of toxicity, gets water, it moves throughout the soil very quickly like nitrogen. Because I know we've done some work at a pound per acre. And you know, on a pound per acre, you have to drill over here. You've got a spacing between them about that far. Uh, in some cases, they've gone to liquid, where you've got a lot more points for the plant to pull it up. But again, it depends on how much organic matter you have, on how much uh, you're going to have available to the plant. But it's so critical in flowering, and it's not just canola, guys. It is all crops that you grow. <laughs> that pollination process is where you get your your yield from, and if, if you've got a shortage of boron and wheat or barley or sunflowers. So this attention level is going to be, be translatable back, say, to mustard crop? Absolutely. Mustard and canola are really, really close cousins. And we grow both. And you'll see definitely uh, an issue with mustard on a low boron soil. Uh, and it's fortunate. Most of our soils are fairly high organic matter, except in the southern part, our dry land, real dry land areas. And the guys are only getting low yields in those dry land areas, so they rarely have a boron issue. And when you look at all the other nutrients that are there, yes, I said zinc was very important in some of those pathways. Uh, we've got probably only 3-4% of the growers in, in Western Canada using zinc. And they're doing it for other reasons. They're doing it, especially if they're seed growers, because zinc is very, very critical in the germination process of wheat in particular. So you've got to have a, a relatively high level of zinc in that seed to really get good germination and emergence. Yes, Curtis. If you wanted to apply boron, you knew, okay, this field's going to be an old mixture, or whatever. Could you put that on with, say, a Roundup application? Is there antagonism, or would that work fine against one of the other? You've got to ask some guru that knows that. <laughs> I would not think there should be, but I would rather see it still go into the ground. It's not going to volatile. It's not. It's not going to go anywhere. Yep. We've done it. How scientific it work? We've done it. But it's rare for me to see a zinc issue in canola. But I, that doesn't mean it isn't happening. It's just I, I have a little problem on on diagnosing a low a low zinc. Well, if you're within two weeks of flowering, you should be okay. Put it in a paper bag and get it into the lab. Just the upper part where your bud cluster is and top couple leaves. That should do it. That's what I take. Yes? What's your thoughts on the... I've got two fields with the same variety. On one field, you grow seven feet tall. On the other, you grow four feet tall. I would have to know what your soil contains on those two fields. They're probably quite different. Or do you find that? Have you done soil tests on it? Yeah. Uh, because so usually varieties are very similar, unless there's something going sideways. So what makes a vegetative growth, excessive vegetative growth? What? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, usually what I find is there's a little bit too high a N availability <laughs> at that early growth stage. You know, you know that uh, that's usually 35 days after seeding, 40 days before you get elongation. And you can correct deficiencies up until that stage. Uh, sulfur, for example, even, even though this is supposed to be micronutrients, we've got a 35-day window to 
solve any sulfur deficiency in canola. You've got a 40-some day window for nitrogen. And I suspect on, on, the, on the micros as well. But it's got to be there for that germination process that gets going. Uh, some of those cofactors for the enzymes are very, very critical. And if they're low, you're not getting enough of the hormone being produced uh, that's going to give you the growth that you want and the correct growth. Yes? What are, you, what are your thoughts on magnesium? On magnesium, we've got some awful high mag soils. And there you're going to really have to try and balance out the amount of, if you've got a high mag soil, you've got to balance out how much K you're going to need because the plant will pull in mag instead of K and you're going to be deficient in potassium. Well, I got very low magnesium soil. Oh, okay. Uh, then you better look at it because it is a very important nutrient uh, as a micronutrient. It, if you go and look at the Krebs cycle, it is activating so many different steps of that whole energy production system within the plant. And if you're minus that, you're not going to get the growth and you're not going to get yield. Not high yields. Magnesium, it's not almost not really considered a micronutrient, it's almost like a secondary nutrient. Well, it's still a micro. <laughs> is there a ratio between magnesium and, and uh, K that you're trying to... We, we've developed uh, ratios on most of it, but be, not being a, a real soils person, although I took six courses in soils, uh, but that's a long time ago. I'd have to get one of our soils gurus to answer that. Sorry. But it is something that we're, we're doing a lot more work on micronutrients than we've ever done before. There's sure enough companies out there flogging it. Uh, and a lot of the times the guys are asking us, okay, are they worthwhile putting on? Are we going to get a response? Uh, this is why we try and get a, a lot of our farm clients to go out and do a strip test and just see whether or not they're getting a response. Micros are tough to work with. Uh, whether or not they're actually valid for you. You know, if you're really low in magnesium, uh, yeah, I'd certainly be looking at it. Manganese? Yeah, Molly is... No, that's molybdenum. Manganese, I have only ran into manganese deficiencies in other countries. I have not seen any in this area. They probably are there, but I just haven't seen them. And in China, I was giving a presentation at one of their top universities, agricultural universities, 45,000 students in ag. And they brought in all the profs and the graduate students. And my whole lecture was on, in English, uh, no interpreter. And I was telling them, you've got to start re-looking at sulfur and they just tore me to pieces. <laughs> they said there's no such thing as a sulfur deficiency in canola in China. And I said, oh, well, just let me show you something. So I popped up a couple of photos that I had taken the week before in, in China and showed them what a very severe sulfur deficiency looked like. <laughs> they changed their mind. Uh, but the, the rationale they gave for no sulfur deficiency is their pollution levels are so high in a wide part of China, they're getting 35 pounds of sulfur per acre. <laughs> you know, but where I'm working up on the Tibetan Plateau at 3,000 meters, they don't have the pollution level and I was finding lots of sulfur deficiency. And it's very, it's very easy to recognize. Uh, basically, uh, at the early growth stage, say you got five leaves out there, and the newest one starts cupping up at the tip end, and then it'll start burning at the tip end. That's that simple, and it is sulfur. And if it's later, always look at your newest leaves, and if they're cupping up at the tips like this, it's a sulfur deficiency. And it's severe enough that it's going to cost you yield.
Like it is such an important ingredient because of all the glucosinolates in canola, in the plant tissue, uh, the basic compound for that particular, uh, that particular chemical group is sulfur. Uh, as I said, up to about 35 days after seeding. Once you go beyond that, you're starting to, it's dropping off your yield potential. It's going to reduce your leaf size. Uh, it will have an impact. I've seen 60% yield loss from sulfur deficiency. Can you get uh, sulfur or barn deficiency because of excess nitrogen? You've got to keep your N to S ratio very close to five to one or six to one, it's going to work. So if you're putting on 100 pounds of sulfur, you better be in that ratio for the sulfur. 100 pounds of N, yeah. But when you're talking about the 35 days or whatever, you're talking about spring variety. I'm talking about spring and winter. It's, it's still going to be the same. That sulfur's got to be there when it regrows in early March. Well, yeah. 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 Well, I noticed quite a few guys t have told me they're not putting any fertilizer on when they seed, but they are putting it on later. And I'd sure want it there early. It's such an important component in so many different things in the plant, not, not just... Uh, right. My point was that if you, took, if, if you wanted to make an additive on a winter variety, you'd have more than 35 days to adjust something. No, uh, it'd be close, because all the plant's done is stall out. It's sitting there, dormant. And so when it starts regenerating growth in the, in the early spring, uh, you'd be able to see a sulfur deficiency at that growth stage. You'd be able to see it if it was severe. Are you going to be able to fix it? Early spring, winter come on. On um, winter, and you see those brand new leaves starting to curl up, yeah, you can go in right away. It's going to maintain enough sulfur through the rest of the plant's life. It may have reduced your leaf area index, and that means you've lost some of your yield. Like, I, wa I love walking into a field just when they're elongating. I can come pretty close to what the yield potential is going to be based on leaf area index, because all leaf area index is an indicator of how much leaf surface area you've got and that elongation, if you don't have a leaf area index of two, which means in one square meter of ground, you've got two square meters of leaf surface area at that growth stage. If you don't have it, you're not going to be able to hit the higher yields. Yes? So, so this winter, we had a freeze in December, of the first of December, so all the tops are completely dead. Yep. It's going to have to regenerate this spring. I mean, it's going to start from the crown. And at how much we were canopied, a lot of people were canopied, and all that tissue is going to be laying there on the ground, so it's probably not going to be available to the plant. No, it won't be. Will you, I would you suggest going in and taking a soil test as soon as the frost is up? Well, you could do a tissue test at that stage, too, once you've got well, enough there's green. No tissue left. Yeah. But once you start getting regrowth of the leaves, before you get elongation of the main stem, uh, you can pull some of those off. You've still got a fairly good window to, to make sure you don't have a big yield loss. Yeah, there, there's some discussion on early planting of winter canola back in July, but restricting the uh, nutrients to, to hold the growth back. And then uh, following it up later with your fertility program. So what, what well, my, I have some question about going in that early. I've seen too much death of plants because they started to bolt. And any plant that starts to bolt in the winter crop is going to die. Pretty close, Curtis, on yours. And so if you're in at the end of July, you're probably okay. But I was looking at the ones that were talking about going in in June. I have some question about what it's doing to the plant metabolism. You're getting, obviously, going to get more vegetative growth, and it's going to be lost. So you've lost some of the capability of that plant in my books. I may be wrong. I work mostly with uh, spring types in North America and winter types in China. <laughs> and 
course, they don't quite get the death kill that we get here. That's not a good answer. <laughs> Curtis, maybe you can speak on that. You, you've gone to the early, relatively I, I, early. I've never gone that early. No, I, there is a window, an optimum window, and I'm not absolutely sure for this area what it is. You know, I saw the research data. Uh, I still have a question. I would want to see some continued work in that area to back it up. So, so is there to know that by Indian or, or, or uh, an Indian? Uh, I'm sorry? Is it a biennial or an Indian? Uh, it's an annual. <laughs> it's only got so really the one the year. Better than the Dormian right now. <coughs> oh, yeah, I've seen too Doesn't many. It Doesn't it regenerate and go from start next spring? Yep, absolutely. Your crown is the key to that. Right. Um, that was our problem at Lethbridge. I was involved in eight years of research work on winter canola at Lethbridge. And we would get six to seven leaf stage before winter. And that's all, and that's ideal. That's optimum for us. What are you getting when you plant in June? I don't, I don't know. Well, maybe I graze it up so I don't have nothing. Uh, grazing's not an issue. It recovers from that. Look at uh, the work that they've done in Australia and that. But if you have a situation like Lethbridge where we get Chinooks end of February and all the snow goes and the plant says hey I'm ready to get going again and it gets going and then we get minus 20 Celsius which is a damn good frost and what it'll do in a lot of cases it doesn't kill the plant it kills the main apical meristem and then you get all these secondary branches up to five of them growing up and they're going to be productive, but they're weak, and that plant will lodge severely. And so I just pulled the financial plug on the research and said, it's too high risk for the farmer. Any correlation in the fertility program or, uh, to uh, oil content? Uh, yeah, we know that uh, uh, you're, you've got to have a good balance of your fertility package to handle oil. Oil is the last thing put down in the seed. Protein comes first, so that's where your end's important, right? So if you've got an out of balance plant and you've got too much in there, you're going to have a lower, pro uh, lower oil content. And we see a huge range, like I go down to the crushers at Lethbridge or up at Lloyd Minster and take, go in their lab and take a look at their data, and it can range from uh, around 24% oil up to 52% oil. So the, and that's, that's where it, it's a problem. I've been recommending to them for about 20 years now of, of paying a premium on oil content. Uh, set a base. Okay, let's set it at 40% or 38. I don't know what your average down here is. Probably much lower than ours. 38, 40? Okay, and we're up to 52 on some of the samples this, from this past year. But the average would be closer to 44, 45% oil. But if you set a base and said, okay, for every 1% of oil over that base, we will pay this amount. And for every percent or below that base, it's a discount. And the Australians have gone that route, and it's worked very effectively for them because what it does, it tells you money, isn't it? It tells you money. You're going to get paid more for a, a product that's higher in oil, and oil is the reason we grow canola. Protein's good, but uh, oil's the number one. In, in uh, South Africa, their, their oil content's running around 37% on average. And it's all Australian varieties, but uh, they're growing it for the protein. So they want high protein. They're going to pour the end to it because they've got this extremely large livestock population down there. I've never seen so many sheep in my life. And they, they will do some grazing at the, at the vegetative stage. And the plant will recover quite nicely. Oh boy, 
I, I have some real question marks about precision planting, especially under our environment. We're going into a soil at three degrees Celsius, damn cold. And that means it's going to take at least 15, 16 days to emerge. You're putting it in in the, in the summer, and it's going to emerge in two, three days, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, yeah. And we want to, we have to go early. Like right where I live, we've only got a growing season of less than 100 days, and our varieties take 105. So we want to put it in the ground early and take the risk of the spring frost just to be able to get it off in the fall. Hey, Phil, uh, apart from million on for phosphate, is there kind of a threshold? Normally, my tests come back around 17 to 19. Is that enough? I'd have to haul my computer out. I'll do that afterwards if you want. We've got attention levels for everything. Like last year, just to give you an idea where AgriTrend's coming from, we were involved in the decision-making, helping the decision-making process with our clients for uh, close to four million acres. Well, you say you've got, you've got these attention levels. Are those available to us? Can we go to a website and look them up? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have agri-coaches. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, one that I run into very rarely, another micro, well, if you want to call it a micro, there's one that's got a little, if you go down into Australia, you're going to find calcium deficiencies, uh, lots of it, because of their soil type. And I have not seen calcium deficiencies in the summer down here. Uh, probably just around when it starts to flower. Uh, the only time I'll see it in Alberta is where we've got water logging happening. And what happens is the inflorescence structure with all the buds on it, early flowers, just totally desiccates and folds over like this and it's just hanging there. And the top newest leaves turn purple. That's a calcium deficiency and it's pretty rare but water logging, canola hates water, by the way. Uh, if you water log, you can really reduce your yields very quickly. Even three days of water logging on canola is going to cost you about 15% of your yield. So any of you that are irrigating, don't water log your field. Because once that ground is saturated, that plant can't absorb any nutrients. It can't even absorb water, even though it's standing in it. It just literally shuts off. And by the time you get up at the rosette stage, it's the most dangerous. And then it gets less sensitive once it gets into flowering. Uh, some very good work was done on that. If it's 14 days, you got a 65% yield loss. Uh, none of the irrigators I know are going to put on that much water. <laughs> Oh boy, they just stall out. They just sit there and they're not doing anything. They're not growing. They'll start drooping the leaves because they're not getting water up. You've got to have oxygen in the rhizosphere for it to pull in all the nutrients and water that it needs. And if there's no oxygen, it can't pull anything up. Other crops are far less sensitive. The cereals and, of course, rice. <laughs> But it's, it's, yeah, it's something uh, I've ran into. We, we, in our far north, they get some real heavy rains when the plants are just before flowering. And that's where I run into this calcium issue. And that's about it. And so really from an overall micronutrient standpoint, uh, boron is probably the only one that I'm going to seriously look at right now. We just don't find it on the other micros. So what about copper? Uh, our soils are really low on copper. Is that something to worry about? Not for canola, but it sure is on cereals. Like, I kid you not, when I said, what happens when you've got a copper deficiency 
on a wheat plant, for example. What happens? The, take a look at it, real close look. That, those buds that are in there, you want the pollination to occur when the flower structure is closed. And when you've got a shortage of copper, that flower structure opens. The minute it opens, and you've got ergot in that field, those things can last a long time in the soil without germinating, and you'll get spores landing in there and you've got ergot. Now, if you've got adequate copper, they stay closed and they won't get infected. But on canola, the only time I've seen canola give me a response uh, to copper was in a 95% organic matter soil, peat bog, peat moss, and no copper in there. And I saw a definitely good response on copper for canola, but that's the only time I've ever seen it. And on a worldwide basis, we just don't run into it very often. It's not a critical nutrient except for one of the hormones, and there's usually enough coming in. Yes, Curtis. Uh, on the irrigation, because I'm asked all the time, soil, so that you're not waterlogging, um, percent of soil capacity? 60%, 70%? Uh, I don't want to get it below the wilting point ever. Like what happens in southern Alberta in our irrigation system is the guys don't slow down their applicator. They're putting on an inch of circle and it's not enough for the heat that they get. And so they've got to slow it down and, and bump their rate of water application. It's not enough to cause water logging. Except if you've got dips and you haven't got a perfectly flat field and you go in those dips where the water stood long enough, you're going to see a huge difference in plant growth. But, uh, you know, we, we've got over a million acres in Alberta of irrigated land and can canola is not a real big factor down there because there's other crops that they can grow that are of higher value. But I still work with guys, and I, one of them in particular, I told him, I said, you know, your, your yields aren't good enough. Of course, that's an insult, isn't it? <laughs> and the reason I said that was he's getting 65 bushels per acre. And I'm telling him he should be targeting 120. And he told me when, this is two, yeah, three years ago, he said, well, Phil, I finally listened to you. I targeted my crop for 100 bushels per acre. And then it got so blasted hot during flowering, I only got 85. But he said, that's sure better than 65. And then the next year, he said, OK, I'm targeting 120 again. I uh, meant moving up to 120. And he was able to get 100 under irrigation. It's entirely feasible. We do a lot of variety testing at Lethbridge under our variety registration program, as well as a, a, it, it's, the Canola Council does a lot of variety testing in Western Canada. And on station at Lethbridge, the Ag Canada station, four out of five years we're obtaining 120 bushels per acre on irrigation. Now, that's small plot. Uh, you can't always duplicate what we're doing in a in small plots. But it is feasible, but it's telling us what the genetic potential is. It's one hell of a lot higher than that. Yes? Can a four-year application of uh, nutrients uh, help in that situation where you have excessive heat? Uh, there is a bit of a response on the boron side for heat damage. That's a, a new paper I picked up. But it, I don't know how, how good it is. It's a no, brand new research paper. Is there anything you can do for a Not at this stage. That, those flowers are just so sensitive when they open. Uh, with that one that I mentioned, this new gene they found in Arabidopsis, there's a possibility that we could improve our temperature control on the plant or our sensitivity to high temperatures. It's not unusual to get up into the 80, and what you see the field do is change color, isn't it? 
that's beautiful yellow and all of a sudden it goes orangey. And when it starts to go orange, you know you've got a heat issue going on in the field. The other, the other question is, during that excessive heat period, we would have tremendous amount of shedding on the bottom side of the flower. Yeah. The I, under irrigation or on dryland, I want to keep those bottom leaves as, alive as long as possible. And yet I see it field after field after field. Farmers assume that's normal for canola. But go back to my leaf area index. The longer you can keep that leaf area index high, you have greater photosynthesis feeding the plant. So what's making the, what's making the plant shed at the bottom of these? Usually N. Because if you pulled off leaves all the way up the plant, put them side by side, what are you going to see? Pale, very pale green before it desiccates. The next one, and as you go up, you get up to about two thirds up the plant, it's dark green again. That's very active photosynthetically. The others have just about quit and desiccating. Well, usually it's not enough. That's what I run into. Guys just assume that's normal and I want to, yes, there's a shading factor in there. Those bottom leaves are only cranking out 15% of your photosynthesis because you've got plants maybe this high. No, they're nine feet tall. Nine feet tall. Boy, I love that variety. <laughs> no, I don't like that at all. I want to see them all within that range for spring types, a little taller on the winter types. But if you're losing bottom leaves in the, in the summer, there's a reason why, and it's usually in. You're not getting adequate N for that plant to keep those lives, uh, leaves alive because N is mobile in the plant. And it, what it happens when the upper parts are running out of nitrogen, they're pulling it out of the bottom leaves to move it up to keep your photosynthesis going up above the plant, aren't they? And so it's usually an N issue. Uh, and those plants need over three pounds per bushel of N. Now, you start getting up to 100 bushels an acre, that's telling you pretty quickly what you need. And we know that we'll keep getting an economic yield response up to 240 pounds, depending on what's in the ground. If we're listening to Dwayne Beck there and uh, others that and can make that soil a heck of a lot more healthy and releasing more in, then we won't have to go that high. It's the estimated nitrogen release from the organic matter that's there. And we do have a formula for that uh, to quickly figure out how much N is going to come out of the organic matter, how much is in the soil, and then we can properly calibrate what we should be applying for a realistic target yield. It's got to be realistic, doesn't it? You don't want to shove on an extra 50 bucks or $70 worth of fertilizer when you're physically, because of your climate or soil type, you can't make it. So will a thicker stock retain life more as far as keeping that leaf area index up than a better stock? No, it's the most plastic plant you're ever going to grow. Uh, you know, the small stocks, they're still photosynthetically active. You're going to get the same yield between anywhere from 7 to 20 plants per square foot, or 4 to that many. Uh, but what's happening when you get a higher plant density You've got very few secondary branches on them. Isn't that? Yep. If you've got 20 plants out there, you've got a much smaller stem. Stem size drops. So that plant starts filling up those higher pods on the plant because that's all it's going to produce. And what happens? You get a little wind, you're going to have a lodging issue on your hand. The, uh, the winter types are probably better because your pot plant density is going to be low. Like, Curtis, how many per square foot? What, what would my ideal be? Maybe three? Yeah. So you've got a very different system. You're going to get a huge number of secondary branches on the plant. So it's compensating. And it's determined by the genetic system and the uh, signaling system. The plant says, I got enough juice coming in here to keep me fed, and I'm going to produce more. And it just puts out a new secondary branch somewhere on the plant. 
Like I've seen plants with 20 branches on them. On our spring types with 10 plants per square foot, you might get three. And we'll still have lodging, especially where guys put way too much manure on. <laughs> So I said this could be a little short. There's not a big issue about micros. They're very specific for certain areas and certain soil types, but we better know what those areas are. And the only way you can do that is testing. Either a soil test, tissue test, or visual diagnosis. And there's people out there that can do it just by looking at a plant. Any other questions? I, I apologize for uh, the shortness of this, but. Uh, yeah, we're doing a slide. Just 10 minutes short. That's fine. <laughs>